Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 399th episode, we have an interview with Maria McNamara all about dinosaur coloration and what else melanosomes could do. We have Dinosaur of the Day, Dioplosaurus, and we have our fun fact. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Randy and Squim, Trent Carbajal, Ermel, Jeff, Amato Titan, Cameron, Albertosaurus, Joaquin, Stefan, and Bill Jago. Yes, thank you so much for being part of our community. We really appreciate you and all of our other patrons. So without further ado, we're going to head on to our interview with Maria McNamara. But of course, if you are a patron, there is an extended version of this interview in your premium content feed. So if you want to hear even more about melanosomes and all the crazy stuff that they can do, then you might want to listen to that instead of this abridged version. So we're joined this week by Maria McNamara, and she's a paleobiologist and professor of paleontology at the School of Biological, Earth, and Environmental Sciences at University College Cork. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thanks a million, Gareth. It's good to be here. So I wanted to ask first about your work on melanin. It kind of blew my mind reading your studies, like how some animals have was it 10 times more melanin inside their bodies in their organs than in the skin or feathers? That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that was what, was, you know, we were working on that, I think, back in 2012. And uh, it was not what we expected. You know, we said that we tested just to play devil's advocate and to see what came up. But we didn't expect there to be so much internal melanin. And actually, that discovery, with the help of my then master's student, Joe Kay, at the University of Bristol, that discovery actually paved the way for the past 10 years of my research. Wow. That's a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> so what? why, I guess, the obvious question is, what's the benefit to having that melanin inside of a body rather than just in the skin? You know, that is the key question here. And uh, finding a satisfactory answer to that is kind of like the holy grail of what <laughs> we're doing at the moment. You know, we have some ideas. So over the last, well, from about 2016 to this year, I built a group using some funds from the ERC the European Research Council, and we started taking a kind of a broad look at melanin in all kinds of locations in the body in a whole range of different vertebrates. So we started looking at birds and mammals and amphibians and reptiles and fish and squid and other squid-like <laughs> things. And we started actually documenting where the melanin was and what type of melanin was there, because there's actually a couple of different forms of melanin. And we found that, well, amphibians and reptiles in particular have an awful lot more melanin inside their body. So in their internal tissues, their heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, reproductive organs, connective tissue, everything in, inside relative to what's in the skin. But then when you look at birds and mammals, you see way more melanin in the uh, hair and feathers. There's almost nothing in the skin and virtually nothing left internally. And, you know, this is a real puzzle. And so we started thinking, you know, well, what's the main difference between a scaly reptile or slimy frog versus a cute, cuddly, you know, <laughs> chick or bunny rabbit? And the, you know, one key difference is, of course, their metabolic strategy, their metabolism the cold-blooded versus warm-blooded. So it turns out that during vertebrate evolution, a real key change happens to the immune system out of, well, to many other body systems, but to the immune system in particular. Amphibians and reptiles, it turns out, they don't have the sophisticated leukocytes and T cells that we have. They have a more, I, I suppose, a simple immune system. 
And they actually depend on melanin rich cells as part of their immune response to fight off invading bacteria and things. Huh. And so they, we wonder if this is one of the reasons why they have so much melanin internally. And especially they have typically they're chock a block full of melanin in the spleen. And the spleen is one of these weird little organs that you can live without. Well, we can live without, but I bet a frog couldn't live without its spleen because mm -hmm. it's critical to, to its immunity, to its immune system. So we wondered then, you know, well, during vertebrate evolution, when you start evolving another type of metabolism and you had changed the immune system along with that hand in hand, well, maybe they, you know, they don't need these melanin rich cells anymore because they've got these fancy T cells and leukocytes mm -hmm. and they can do a much better job at fighting off COVID and all kinds of other infections. Mm -hmm. So they don't need as much melanin inside. So the question is, why does all the melanin shift into the hair and the feathers? Clearly, we still need a lot of melanin. And so we think that there's actually a couple of other functions hidden away here. One very obvious function is color, of course. You know, melanin is really useful for generating color. You know, you can generate blacks, browns, greys, ginger, reddish colors, quite a nice variety. And, you know, when you factor in patterning, you can produce some very nice patterns. But the really interesting thing is that, you know, our bodies, fair enough, they might choose to use melanin to produce visible color. And so that we can attract mates or camouflage ourselves from predators, whatever the case may be. But the thing is, that every bit of melanin that we produce is actually toxic. Melanin is, and um, the production of melanin produces free radicals. And mm. you might have heard about free radicals in ads for expensive <laughs> skin creams and things <laughs> like that. Uh, and, you know, eat your antioxidants, your fruits and veg rich in antioxidants. It's to actually reduce the impact of free radicals in our system. They basically cause damage to our DNA. Nobody mm. wants DNA damage. That's mm -hmm. that's not going to end up well, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're producing all this melanin, but it's actually toxic. And it's unfortunately, Gareth, I think you're a redhead, are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm afraid that the, the, the form of melanin that produces reddish colors is even more toxic oh, no. than oh, no. the form of melanin <laughs> that, that brunettes have. Yeah, you produce way more free radicals. So there's a real evolutionary cost to producing it. So if you think about it, poor amphibians and reptiles, they're producing melanin because they need it for their immune system. But it's actually having an, a cost, a physiological cost. And it's like a tax on their bodies. Whereas once you evolve a more sophisticated immune system, and maybe this was actually one of the drivers for evolving a more sophisticated immune system, instead of having all this melanin inside fighting off infection, evolve better cells that are better able to do that and shift all that melanin out into your feathers and hair. So is there a reason we have to have melanin? Like, why not just not have melanin at all? I know. I know. Why not have melanin? Yeah, we could all be albinos. You know, we could all have just no coloration. Well, you know, some melanin is useful because it does, you know, it protects us from UV rays from the sun. So it's, it, it's important for photo protection. But also, we discovered that the melanin in animals' bodies uh, is full of metals is really rich in metals. And that when you look at the melanin from different organs, it actually has contains different metals in different organs and tissues. So skin melanin is really rich in calcium, but liver mel melanin is really rich in copper and so on. And it turns out that melanin is really well known for its ability to bind metals. So we think that we have to produce some melanin to basically lock up metals that we're ingesting and taking in in our food and from the environment. So the melanin is actually really useful as a sink for those metals. It just sucks them up and locks them away. And if you don't need melanin circulating in your body to fight off infection anymore, well, then as soon as it's produced and soaks up the metals, put it into an inert tissue, something that's 
non-reactive, not involved in physiological systems anymore, shunt it into your feathers and hair, and hey presto, you've sucked up your metals and you've got rid of your melanin and you're using it for coloration. So it's very clever, actually. Yeah, yeah. That were, that's a random piece of trivia I remember from my childhood was if you get poisoned by arsenic, you can detect it in the hair. Is that, that's in the melanin in the hair? Is that yeah, how it works? it's in the melanin, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. interesting. That is. Can it, is it like enough, how much, is it a lot of metal, like poisonous metals that you can get out of your body through this? Or is it kind of a small amount? Well, we don't know what the maximum amount is. <laughs> and we're kind of not allowed to do those kinds of experiments. Oh anymore. yeah, not on people. <laughs> but no, but I will share with you, there was a paper where some researchers, you know, back over 50 years ago, took some poor frogs and put them into water that was enriched with metals from a mine tailings pond. Oh, man. And the poor frogs, they turned black. And when they cut them open, all their organs had turned black because they were producing so much melanin to actually try and detoxify their systems from the metals. So our bodies have the ability to respond, you know, and, and produce melanin in response to metal levels around us. But, you know, it raises all kinds of interesting questions and ideas about, you know, well, maybe we should be using melanin to clean up contaminated land and contaminated water and things like that. So I'm kind of starting to think about those kinds of things now as well. Um, Try and do something useful for a change, as my dad would say. (laughs) Well, that's the thing about science. You, You research these like fundamental things. You never can imagine which direction they'll lead. Mm hmm. That's so cool. Yeah. I think I have a pretty good grasp on how like our immune system works with like the T cells and all that kind of stuff. How does melanin, how does that help in the same way that it binds to metal? Can it bind to foreign contaminants? So it's it's not the melanin per se, but it's actually melanin rich cells called melanomacrophages. So a macrophage is any kind of a cell that gobbles up other cells. And in amphibians and reptiles, they have these special melanomacrophages that are just rich in melanin. Oh, cool. Basically. So then, I guess, kind of a segue, they're related, melanosomes. (laughs) You were looking at melanosomes and we can kind of, I guess, figure out through those, the colors in some cases of certain dinosaurs. Ah, yes. sort of. No, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the eumelanin versus pheomelanin thing? No, the so so you look eumelanin and pheomelanin are two different chemicals. That's absolutely fine, and there's no argument about that. What is very unclear at the moment is what is inside a melanosome. You know, melanosomes are these little. They're not even cells. They're smaller than cells. They're little parts of cells. They're organelles. So they, they're in the same class of structure as a nucleus. <laughs> um, so they're very small little things. They're only about a micron long. So if you stack them end to end, a hundred of them would fit across the width of one human hair. So very <laughs> tiny. But, you know, these things, there is a lot of evidence that in birds, melanosomes fall into two distinct types and that the... They differ in shape, and the shape is linked to the chemical composition, the type of melanin present. So the the sausage-shaped melanosomes are usually rich in eumelanin. The football-shaped melanosomes are usually rich in pheomelanin. And although that seems fairly distinct in birds, there's no evidence for that dichotomy in any other taxon and, and in any other tissue outside of feathers. We're looking at melanosomes from all of our different tissues, lungs, heart, liver, so on, and they all contain eumelanin and pheomelanin. When we analyze this, we analyze it in bulk. It's like taking a bucket of sand, a bucket of marbles, right? And the marbles are, the marbles, you don't know if the marbles are different colors or if they're all the same color. They're all the same shape. And you analyze the chemistry and you see a mixture. So we don't know actually do we have melanosomes of the same shape, but are made of different stuff? Or if they all have a mixture inside? And it may sound like a bit of a 
a pedantic question, but it's actually really interesting from an evolutionary point of view because that the the ginger form of melanin, theomelanin, is more toxic. We're really interested in when did that evolve and mm. which evolved first mm -hmm. and the, what are the pros and cons of having one form or the other. So it, we're really interested in trying to pin down what's going on inside the melanosomes and looking at it kind of from an evolutionary perspective. So that's something that we're doing right now. So I don't have an answer for you yet. <laughs> sure. <laughs> my, my poor PhD student is starting on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> but, we'll, we'll, uh, have to, we'll have to talk to you again later then. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I've got, I've got a few people working on this actually. So yeah, we're, we're very interested in tracking down the kind of chemical evolution of melanin. And did you, like, you know, we've got two options. Three options. I, if you melanin evolved first, why did fair melanin evolve if it's more toxic? Mm. One reason is, well, maybe because it allows you to produce some really striking reddish colors. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're used in signaling. Like if you think of a little zebra finch, you know, it has those lovely orange cheeks. It, it's using those in sexual display to advertise fitness. You know, look how healthy I am. Look at my beautiful orange color patch. <laughs> maybe that was uh, driven by actual sexual selection. Or maybe it was the other way around. You know, maybe fea melanin evolved first and maybe eumelanin evolved later. If that was the case, what are the pros of eumelanin? Well, number one, it's less toxic. Number two, it absorbs colors over a broader range of the visible spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it offers better UV protection. So mm. both options are sort of plausible and <laughs> maybe they both evolved at the same time. We we just don't know. So yeah, it's interesting. That is interesting. The, yeah. It's also when you said that only birds have that connection between the shape and the type of melanin makes you wonder how many dinosaurs would that include? Because <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah. there's somewhere along the way where dinosaur you know the only thing left of dinosaurs are birds but yeah how far yeah back yeah can you exactly extrapolate? exactly i know i know I, it's definitely something that needs to be looked at better I and mean, you know we have ways of doing it for instance i mentioned the metals the different types of, of melanin they actually like different metals hmm. so what we're going to start doing is actually mapping metals distribution within individual melanosomes so for instance, you know, if we find more copper inside, well, maybe that's the eumelanin. If we find more zinc, for instance, it could be phaeo. But we're also going to, there's new kind of technologies that are coming online with like different particle accelerators that um, we can actually look at the, the organic molecular signatures for the different types of melanin at that tiny, tiny spatial level. So we're going to start doing that hopefully now in the next year or so. So if you're if a melanosome is a micron, or did you say a tenth of a micron? No, a, a better micron. Yeah, <laughs> a micron. How small? Because uh, then you're just looking at individual melanin molecules at that point. Uh no, we well no, we can't look at melanin molecules. And you've got to remember, you know, well, it's one thing looking at melanin in modern animals. It's a very different kettle of fish looking at it in fossils. When you look at the fossil material, you know, it's, you can't say that the, you can see the melanosomes preserved. There's no question about that, but you can't say that they contain melanin mm. in its state as it was in life. Yes, yeah, long gone. Because it's been, mm -hmm. it's been, well, no, it's not that it's long gone. It, the, you, it actually survives. Traces of melanin survive. Yeah. Melanin has kind of, when you look at the molecule, People don't really understand the structure of melanin. But when you look at when you look at what we think we know, the melanin molecule is a big complicated thing and it has four basic building blocks. If you think like DNA has four basic building blocks, the four mm -hmm. different amino acids, the building blocks in melanin, we can actually detect these even in fossils, which is really cool. So we don't know if the whole molecule is intact, but we can definitely identify some of the building blocks. But, you know, it's been cooked, so it kind of gets turned into kind of long carbon chains a little bit as well. Sometimes it gets kind of vulcanized like rubber. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you get all kinds of funky things going on during fossilization. 
Yeah. Is it useful? So those building blocks, I, I presume they are there in different proportions depending on whether it's a different type of melanin. Is that how it's useful? Yeah, exactly. Different proportions and actually completely different building blocks oh, cool. for eumelanin and pheomelanin. So it's it's very diagnostic. It's great. The only the slight difficulty with, you know, you're saying, well, why don't you just go out and analyze all the fossils, Maria? <laughs> the, the problem is that a type of analysis, it's done using um, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, and it actually requires, well, for a lay person, if I were not a scientist, I would uh, scoff at the size of samples I was sending away for analysis. They are very, very small, just a couple of millimeters in size. But when all the melanin you've been able to extract or pick or been allowed to sample of a fossil is half a millimeter, mm -hmm. you know, and that's all you're allowed to take, you don't have enough for this analysis. Mm. So, you know, we've got to ask ourselves some hard questions. We either put a rake of time and money into trying to make that process more efficient so that we can analyze minuscule samples or else we get better at analyzing modern melanin using other techniques. The problem is, is that the analysis, which is great for the fossils, which is the LCMS, is also quite good for modern melanin, but you can, mm. can get interference effects from proteins. The problem is, most tissues are chock-a-block full of proteins. And <laughs> even melanosomes are full of proteins. So it can be a little bit difficult because you can have a peak for protein right beside your peak for melanin and you're trying to say, oh, which is it? Which have I got? It's even more difficult using another technique called TOF-SIMS. So TOF-SIMS is another one of these mass spectrometry techniques. Um, but instead of like vaporizing your sample, you actually just firing an ion beam at the surface and you're blasting off a tiny little layer off the top of your sample. You don't even notice that when you get your sample back, it's, it looks the same. But <laughs> that type of analysis is really good because it's basically, it basically, it destroys the uppermost few nanometers of your sample. <laughs> but you basically get your sample back, you know. So it's great. It's great for those fossils. But it's really difficult to do the analysis on the modern material because it's really sensitive to the presence of any proteins. So we just ran some analyses and our samples, we have to clean them again, you know, and the washings, you're basically working with these little vials and you're pipetting in your solution, <laughs> pipetting out your solution, and you're doing it so carefully to not disturb. The melanosomes are literally floating around in this thing. Oh. Oh, wow. And it's, it's a real head wrecker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's all part of the challenge, you know. How, how are we going to get this to work? And, you know, it's very, it's very interesting because you very quickly see people in your team who's got really good hand-eye coordination. Mm -hmm. They're always really useful, you know. <laughs> it's for anyone with a steady hand. You, you discover all these skills about yourself that you didn't know. Or, you know, needlework, all that needlework, you know, mm -hmm. I did as a kid. <laughs> you know, that finally comes in useful. <laughs> when it comes to on the fossil side of things, since we're the dinosaur podcast, got to ask about the dinosaurs. <laughs> the, the dinosaurs that are found in China, they those tend to preserve pretty well, right? Well, yes and no. It depends on which levels you're working on. Some of the levels are most of what you see is really oxidized. You know, the, the laminated mudstones have kind of turned yellowish. The iron has all rusted. You know, any of the pyrite has rusted to iron oxide. And, uh, you know, the, the oxidation affects the melanosomes. They actually dissolve and they leave behind little shrouds or ghosts. So we did a study showing how this happens. But, it, you know, showing that it is oxidation that does this to the melanosomes. Some of the levels then, you know, where they're from deeper down, where the where rainwater hasn't percolated down as deep, where the rocks are grey, that's when you get really excited because it means then that they're they're still anoxic and the, the then the carbon is much better preserved and then you get much much cleaner melanosomes. Oh cool. Yeah. So sometimes. <laughs> yeah. That's always the answer in paleontology. Sometimes <laughs> it works. <laughs> when you're lucky. 
Cool. So it sounds like, I think we had said before that you basically the only colors we're going to be able to find from melanosomes in best case scenario are basically black and brown and reddish. Reddish, yeah. Is there any other color you can get from a melanin? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, not my group, but other groups have done work showing that depending on the exact geometries of the melanosomes, they could be generating iridescence. Oh, so, yeah. so far, mm. we, we only have evidence for fairly weak iridescence in a few feathered dinosaurs. Uh, in Microraptor, a, you know, kind of a bluish color in Inca Yaku, a penguin. Uh, we have kind of iridescence as well in Kai Hong. So there's a few that seem to have these really ultra elongate melanosomes that in modern birds are tend to be associated with, with the generation of a metallic sheen, kind of like what you'd see on a starling. So we definitely have that kind of, those kinds of optical effects. There's also a study, a bird from the Messel deposit, where the melanosome shape was very similar to that, to the melanosomes that you see in birds that have non-iridescent structural colors. Oh, so, yeah. so, you know, really bright blues, like in the blue of a, of a blue jay, for instance. Those kinds of colors, they are also structural. They're generated by, you know, by, by the scattering of light as, as it passes through very ordered tissue nanostructures. So the melanosomes aren't producing the blue color but they're kind of there at the base they're like acting as a backing pigment because the light is coming in and it's passing through that wonderful order tissue structure and if it were to you know uh, bounce off the other side and refract around inside it would all it would cause kind of more chaotic scattering mm. but the melanosomes just mean that the make sure that the light comes in passes through the structure gets absorbed no interference effects. It's like black so opal. Helping, <laughs> yeah, but it helps to make a really pure color. So mm. rather than having a kind of a, just a bright color, you actually have a really pure hue. So a really pure blue or a really pure violet, for instance, it could be tuned optically. So anyway, it seems that those melanosomes can be tracked at least as far back as the Eocene, so 50 odd million years. But we know, you know, melanosomes can also produce grays and they can also produce, you know, the, the orange reddish colors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they, they do occupy quite a range of colors. But, you know, the, the big question is, you know, we can't be sure that they're the only pigment present or the only, the only color producing mechanism present when the animal was alive. Because, you know, looking at modern birds, we did a study back in 2013 where we showed that modern birds with feathers that are colored by carotenoids, making red, yellow colors, with terrans, with uh, cytocofulvins, with uh, structural colors, they all have melanosomes. So, you know, the, the big risk is, is that if you only reconstruct color in fossils using melanosomes, <laughs> that actually there might be this whole other color component that's not preserved but uh, that actually was really important in producing a completely different visual signal to what you're interpreting. So, you know, we're going to be working on that over the next couple of years, trying to see if we can get some insights there. Mm. That's really interesting because I know all the recreated, what was the first one? Was it Anchiornis? Where they, they were saying it was red and black mostly, and they found the different melanosomes. But from what you're saying, it's like, well, yeah, those melanosomes are there, but we don't know what else was there. So maybe if there was something else creating color, it could have maybe had something a else. totally different yeah. color. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there are probably some colors for which you could have a higher degree of confidence. Like, you could probably be quite confident about the red colors because of the physiological cost and because <laughs> they can produce very intense colors. They tend to be used in isolation. So birds tend not to pair pheomelanin with anything else. Gotcha. If there's pheomelanin there, that's your signal. <laughs> um, you know, and for instance, white. Well, yeah, wh white is dangerous, but black, very, where you have very dense concentrations of melanosomes. I think it's fairly safe to say that was a dark color, right? Mm -hmm. But it kind of everything in between the absence of melanosomes, does that mean white? Or where you have some, does that mean grey or light brown, for instance? 
I think that the the most accurate answer there is probably not, <laughs> but we just we can't resolve that uncertainty any better right now. But watch this space. Yeah. Yeah. While you were talking about different melanosomes too, I remember the the penguin one. Like there's like a penguin melanosome or penguin shaped color. I'd never figured out what penguin color is. Is that like another version of black? So the the, peng, the melanosomes that were identified by Julia Clark and colleagues in 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 Kayaku, they just had their shape was not quite as elongate as the iridescence forming melanosomes, but they were long rods basically, mm. and they were effectively identical in shape to these melanosomes that you only get in modern penguins that produce this kind of bluish gray color. Okay. So it's some, it's some kind of diagnostic, yeah, you know, shape. And, you know, there's some suggestion, you know, melanosomes, they're not uh, clearly, look, we've talked about immunity and we've talked about metal sinks, but, you know, melanosomes are potentially doing other things in the tissues, like in feathers. You know, many birds have dark tips, to their feathers and dark tips to their wings. And it's because the melanin just makes the thing stronger. It makes it more, more robust, more resilient. So, you know, the, it, it was suggested in that paper on Inke Yaku's blue, bla, blue feathers that, that maybe this particular shape of melanosome actually was, uh, you know, helping to stiffen the feathers maybe and contributing to hydrodynamic function. So, you know, th there's all a lot of things that, look, we're at the tip of the iceberg. You know, every, every time we look at a new fossil, there's a whole other problem to unpack. Um, so there's still an awful lot we don't, we don't, we don't know. But yeah, melanin isn't just about color. There's a, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, that's interesting. Speaking of feathers, since you brought that up, I know you've done some work studying feathers as like, complex feathers in an ornithischian, also proto feathers and pterosaurs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Ah, sure. Yeah. So that's that's my other love, um, feather <laughs> evolution. And uh, oh, I guess too often you look at feathers and actually your problem is melanosomes, you know. Um, <laughs> so I guess the, the work that we published so far on Calindodromius and the little anurachnathid pterosaurs Basically, we weren't looking at the melanin. We were, we weren't using, you know, the, the scanning electron microscopes, et cetera. We were literally just looking at the structure of these things because I guess, you know, the, this, when did feathers evolve and what were the first animals to have feathers is one of the most loaded questions in paleontology <laughs> today. And, uh, you know, look, Feather dinosaurs have been around a long time. You know, it's they're coming up to their 30 year anniversary soon in another couple of years. But, um, uh, you know, for a long time, people only really accepted that uh, it was bird like dinosaurs, theropods mm -hmm. that that had feathers. And, you know, any kind of weird little scratchings or any little marks associated with other dinosaurs, they couldn't possibly be feathers. Uh, because they were too far removed from modern birds. But, you know, people did find kind of simple hair-like structures in some ornithischian dinosaurs and things like Bapiosaurus, for instance, it has a tuft of weird filaments on its tail. Even some theropods don't have feathers, per, you know, don't, don't have what look like modern complex compound feathers with a vein and barbs and barbies that they just, again, have this kind of hair-like structure. So there was an awful lot of debate about what those were. Are they feathers? Are they proto-feathers? Are they not feathers? Are they collagen fibers from the skin? And I guess that was only really put to bed in our 2014 paper on the little Russian ornithischian, um, the little vegetarian ornithischian, the dromius, where we found that, yep, all right, it has these hair-like filaments. That's not particularly novel. They've been found before in a basal dinosaur. But what was novel was that we did find two other types of feathers. These weird ribbon-like feathers, which don't occur in modern birds. Quite a few dinosaurs had them, actually. Hmm. Not quite sure what they're about. Maybe they're just <laughs> a, a symptom of, you know, evolutionary experimentation 
before feathers really get constrained into particular functions, you know, especially in flight. So it had these weird ribbon-like feathers, but also it had complex feathers. It has uh, little bunches or tufts of filaments emerging very close to each other in a kind of a, a dark little patches in the skin that might be something like a scale or a basal plate. We're not quite sure yet. But, you know, the bottom line is it had structures that were more than just simple monofilaments. Mm -hmm. It had tufts of feathers. By all accounts, that is a compound structure feather. And, uh, you know, that provided our first real strong evidence that feathers evolved very early in the dinosaur lineage. And, you know, there was a bit of pushback on that. And then gradually there was no more. So we reckon that people had gone silent either because they were sick of it or because they accepted it. Um, and then we started working on the pterosaurs from the Chinese Jurassic. And, uh, you know, when I first looked at them, I, I didn't really believe it. I was like, what? What? Is this a fake? Because you do get fakes yeah. uh, in China. You know, it's not unknown for, you know, very enthusiastic farmers to stick together <laughs> pieces of completely different organisms. But anyway, these were, you know, very nicely preserved. The carbon looked good. And, you know, there were tufts of filaments again. And in those pterosaurs, I mean, some of these tufts were joined at the base. Some of them had a kind of a, a, a shape whereby they were kind of one filament at the base and then branched in the middle, or some of them kind of even branched a little bit along their length. Now, we were kind of, in one way, very excited, in one way, slightly terrified, because we knew <laughs> this was going to be even more controversial. Because, you know, pterosaurs had been known to have some kind of hair-like structures for years. This was old news. They were called pycnofibers. Everyone knew pterosaurs had pycnofibers. <laughs> but we said, well, you know, these things are branching. They're branching in different ways. And the, 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 the structures with the different branching, they're in different parts of the body. We see that in birds. We see localization of different feather types. And we said, let's do some chemical analyses. Right. We'll see what they're made of. And they're made, we found, we used a technique called um, FTIR, so uh, infrared spectroscopy, just basically analyzing the vibration of bonds in molecules in the fossil tissue. And we got a signature that was consistent with keratin. And now so we're asking those, right, okay, it's, it's made of keratin like feathers. It's, it's branching, feathers branch too. <laughs> so if it's, if it looks like a feather and it smells like a feather, <laughs> why are we calling these things pycnofibers? Why don't we call these things feathers? And we, we realized that actually, if we did that, you know, we've, we had evidence that these things had feather-like morphologies and feather-like chemistry. So maybe these are feathers. And that means that feathers didn't evolve way up there at the top of the dinosaur tree in birds, they didn't even evolve in theropods or in ornithischians. They actually evolved much more basal to that, much earlier than that. So we would argue that actually the finding of the feathers in the pterosaurs means that you've got feathers in pterosaurs, you've got feathers in dinosaurs. Okay, you might have convergent evolution. The two groups might independently have come up with the same idea of, yeah, I'm going to stick keratin out of my skin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and make it branch and do all these weird funky shapes or else they actually might share a common ancestor that you know so there's a common ancestor back there in the group called the ave metatarsalians which mm -hmm. is one of my favorite words <laughs> uh so there's some uh, there's some common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs that evolved feathers and that would put the origin of feathers it pushes it back 70 million years into the Triassic. So when we ask that question, when did feathers evolve and in what kinds of creature, it's not what we thought. And, uh, you know, look, the problem is we have a big gap in the fossil record. We don't find the right kinds of fossils in the kind of early middle Triassic. And that's exactly 
where we need to be looking. Yeah. So, uh, mm. yeah. If it hadn't been for COVID, I would have been in the field last year looking mm. at some choice localities. But we're just going to have to wait until we can get our permits and stuff. So, look, hopefully, fingers crossed, we might get in the field this year. Yeah, hopefully. Awesome. So for our listeners, where's the best place to find out more about you and your work? Okay, my group has a very nice website. It's mariamcnamara.ucc.ie. And if you go on there, you can find out more about our research. You can download all of our papers. You can watch some videos. You can look at what we get up to in the lab every week. (laughs) We have a blog where we post photos. And we also have a section about, you know, for the, for youngsters out there who might be wondering how could they become a paleontologist, we have a section about that as well on our website. So we have some fairly, you know, lots of different types of information out there. Awesome. Yeah. And some information on the uh, Ireland's fossil heritage as well, which is cool. Yeah. This is a project which is just getting off the ground right now, actually. And um, believe it or not, you know, we have a very poor, gen- in general terms, tradition of studying fossils in Ireland. It's not like the UK where there were, you know, many prominent paleontologists, you know, in the age of Darwin and Wallace and Huxley and all of those. You know, we, we had very little. And even now, rocks are perceived by a lot of Irish people as, you know, building stone, you know, Kids love fossils, you know, and Mm -hmm. so we're really trying to kind of capitalize upon that energy and excitement. And um, we're just trying to generate some resources for the public. So some interactive maps showing people where they can go and and see fossils, you know, some information about common Irish fossils, you know, little career features so kids can see, right, you know, I could do that. How do I go do that? You know, what subjects do I pick in school and so on? So, yeah, we're just trying to raise awareness, actually, and create a useful resource for people. Awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. No problem. Thank you so much again, Maria, for coming on to our show. It was awesome hearing about melanin and melanosomes and how they can tell you way more than just the color of an animal. Yeah. And in just a moment, we'll get into our Dinosaur of the Day Dioplosaurus. But real quick, we're going to pause for a sponsor break. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Dioplosaurus, which was a request from Crow via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Dioplosaurus was an ankylosaur. Well. <laughs> yes. And it lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Alberta, Canada, found in the Dinosaur Park formation. It looked like other ankylosaurs. It had armor covering its body, it walked on all fours, and it had a tail club. Ooh, an ankylosaurid. <laughs> yes. Even more reason for you to like it. Mm-hmm. Gotta have a tail club. <laughs> Except for Borealopelta, that one's still cool. Mm. So Dioplosaurus was estimated to be between 13 to 15 feet or 4 to 4.5 meters long and weigh 3,300 to 5,500 pounds or 1,500 to 2,500 kilograms. Pretty big. Oh, I was going to say it was relatively small. Maybe it's average sized. <laughs> yeah. It did have a long, narrow tail club, too. And that tail club had 10 vertebrae that formed the handle and several osteoderms that formed the knob. Nice. And the tail club knob was longer than it was wide. It probably wasn't born with its tail club. It would have formed it later in life. And it's possible that the tail club found in Diaplosaurus, the specimen, was still growing. Hmm. So maybe it was small at this point, but it would have gotten bigger as an adult. Yeah, true. In 2009, Victoria Arbor did a study. They did CT scans of clubs that were referred to Diaplosaurus and Euoplocephalus on the impact force of ankylosaur tail club strikes and found Diaplosaurus couldn't generate enough force to puncture bone because its knob was too small. Mm, so it couldn't break, break legs yeah. like ankylosaurus could. Or Zool. That may mean that the knobs weren't primarily for defense and maybe they were also used for display. Or bashing into other Dioplosaurus. <laughs> Maybe. For <laughs> competition. Dioplosaurus had slender blade-like neural spines and triangular osteoderms on the sides of the front of the tail. The sacral fenestrae, holes in the pelvis, also formed a butterfly-like arrangement. So some interesting details about the skeleton. Mm-hmm. 
It was an herbivore, and the type species is Diaplosaurus acutosquamius. It was described by William Parks in 1924, and the genus name Diaplosaurus means double-armored lizard. The species name Acutosquamius means sharp scale. That's kind of a fun one. Sharp scale. And double armored. Yeah. Yeah. It was closely related to Scolosaurus and Anodontosaurus. Some other cool ankylosaurids. You think all of them are cool. Yeah, I do. (laughs) Because they are all cool. (laughs) (laughs) The holotype of Diaplosaurus was found in 1919 by Levi Sternberg near Red Deer River. And that includes a partial skull roof, jaw fragments with teeth, osteoderms, skin impressions, vertebrae, tail club, lower leg bones, and ribs. It was mostly the back half of the dinosaurs, and the front half was mostly missing. But they think the holotype was probably an almost fully mature individual. Hmm. So I guess going back, maybe it didn't grow that much bigger. The skull originally of the holotype was comprised of several scattered fragments, but a lot of the fragments were discarded in 1924 because they couldn't be articulated. Oh, don't throw it away just because you can't put it together. (laughs) And the rest made up an incomplete front of the skull roof. At least there's the skull roof, the front of the skull roof. Yeah, it's a little heartbreaking. They threw away pieces of the skull. Well, (laughs) different practices, I guess. They didn't know how important skulls of ankylosaurs would be, that that's basically how we define an ankylosaurus now, or ankylosaurid. Yeah. Parks wrote, the tail club was, quote, distinctly different from any previously described, and as far as I am aware, from any that have been collected, end quote. So you can see they place the importance on the tail club. Yeah. Three teeth were preserved with the fragments, but Parks only illustrated the one that he considered the best in his description. That tooth, though, has since been lost, (laughs) but the other two teeth are still around. Okay. That's not nearly as big of a loss as the skull, though, because ankylosaur teeth don't tend to be all that different. In 1930, Gilmore referred a skull to Diaplosaurus based on similarities in the teeth and having osteoderms on the skull, but he said the skull looked a lot like Euoplocephalus tutus. He also said that Parks' illustration of the Diaplosaurus tooth in 1924 was inaccurate. The tooth looked more notosaurid than ankylosaurid, and proposed corrections including his own illustrations of the teeth. Two specimens have been referred to Diaplosaurus that have partial tail clubs. In 1956, Maleev named a second species, Diaplosaurus giganteus, based on a large specimen with caudal vertebrae, foot bones, and osteoderms, including a partial tail club knob. Mm. And those fossils were found in Mongolia in the Namek Formation. That's cool. Yeah. Malif said it had similar vertebrae to Diaplosaurus acutosquamius, but it was different because it was bigger. However, in 1977, Diaplosaurus giganteus was reassigned to Tarkia by Tumanova, and it became Tarkia gigantea. In 2014, Victoria Arbor and others found the holotype to not have diagnostic features. It had features in common with all ankylosaurines and considered it to be a nomum dubium. Maybe if they still had all those pieces of the skull, (laughs) we would have had some features that were unique. Oh, no, this refers to the Tarkia gigantea. Oh, that's right. That never had any skull in the first place. That was like legs and farther back. Yeah. Yeah, You can't really name an ankylosaur based on only that, unfortunately. It's difficult. And they also said that the differences in size could be from individual variation or ontogeny. Yeah, for sure. In 1971, Walter Coombs synonymized Diaplosaurus, Scolosaurus, and Anodontosaurus with Euoplocephalus. One of the Diaplosaurus jaws was the same as other Euoplocephalus specimens. When he was synonymizing, he said the variability in ankylosaur skulls from Dinosaur Park Formation and Horseshoe Canyon Formation meant that either each specimen was its own species or there was only one species of ankylosaur, and he decided there was only one species. A true lumper. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Then in 2009, Victoria Arbor and others re-described Diaplosaurus and found it to be valid. He said the hips, vertebrae, and especially the tail was different enough. Oh, wow. Without a skull. Yeah. Well, there was that part of the skull, but yeah, anyway. They suggested the synonymy was because of the fragmentary nature of the specimens of Euoplocephalus. 
They wrote, quote, it might be necessary to look beyond traditional cranial characters in order to accurately appraise the number and nature of various ankylosaurid taxa, end quote. Well then. Yeah. Going beyond the skulls. So Arbor and others proposed that the variation in skulls meant that there were multiple types of ankylosaurs. So the skulls are still important. Euoplocephalus was also found in a younger formation in the Horseshoe Canyon formation, a couple million years younger than the formation where Dioplosaurus was found in the Dinosaur Park formation. Then in 2011, Thompson and others confirmed that yes, Dioplosaurus was valid. Also in 2011, Tetsuto Miyashita and others looked at the skulls of Euoplocephalus and mentioned that there are no skull characters that separate Dioplosaurus from Euoplocephalus. The features that make them unique are in the pelvis and the feet, so it's possible that some skulls referred to Euoplocephalus may be Dioplosaurus. Oh, interesting. Because we don't have the feet <laughs> so to differentiate between the two. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard when you don't have a fully articulate skeleton for comparison purposes. Yep, you gotta use what you got. Dioplosaurus lived in an area with frequent flooding, and other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Dioplosaurus include the Ankylosaurus Edmontonia, Euoplocephalus, and Scolosaurus, Ceratopsids like Chasmosaurus, Hadrosaurs like Carithosaurus, Gryposaurus, and Parasaurolophus, Tyrannosaurs like Gorgosaurus, Dromaeosaurs like Hesperonychus, Troodontids like Latinovenetrix, and Cenonathids like Cenonathus and Chirostenodes. And our fun fact of the day is that dinosaurs can help us detect contamination in the environment by using their feathers. Oh. So after our interview with Maria, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole reading some of the latest articles about melanosomes, about feathers and hair and what kind of contamination they've picked up and if there was any examples of us being able to detect high metal concentration in bird feathers, for example. And it turns out that has been done. So there's a recent article by Jagannathan Pandian and others in Scientific Reports, and they tested the feathers of birds in India, specifically in two sites along the coast with lots of birds. Hmm. They were along the Central Asian Flyway, and the Central Asian Flyway covers the whole Indian subcontinent plus areas to the north and west of India. And there's a lot of migration that happens with these birds. There's multiple flyways within Asia, but that's just the Central Asian one, which is the one that they were looking at. Both of the sites they tested are near the southern tip of India in the state of Tamil Nadu. And unfortunately for the birds there, they are finding quite a bit of heavy metal contaminants in those bird feathers, just like how our hair can collect. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So in the bird feathers, they found the most zinc, followed by nickel, cobalt, chromium, copper, lead, and the least was mercury. But those are some pretty nasty things to have in your body, which is why it's useful that the birds can use their melanosomes to sort of get it out of their body and into their feathers. Mm-hmm where, you know, feathers are just dead structures, just like our hair is, so it's, it's no longer going to harm them. So it's a good way to protect themselves. It is, but in the meantime, before they can get it out of their body, it can still do a lot of damage, potentially. Mm -hmm. The contaminants varied a lot depending on the bird species, so it basically depends on what the birds were eating. For example, many metals run off from cities and agricultural land, and they can collect in crustaceans, fish, plants, or other bird food, depending on what kind of a metal it is and how those animals are at the very low trophic levels are interacting with the environment. And then they bioaccumulate in the birds that eat them. Hmm. So if there's a crustacean that absorbs a bunch of zinc and then a bird eats a lot of crustaceans, it's going to have even more zinc in it than those crustaceans do because it'll bioaccumulate. The heavy metals don't really leave the body other than a little bit through this trapping it with melanin into the feathers. So, yeah, they get a lot of it in their body. And that's the same reason you get mercury in tuna because it's at the top of the food chain and it eats little fish that get some mercury and then those get eaten by bigger fish. And at the very top, you've got a tuna that's getting a ton of that bioaccumulated mercury into its body. So since zinc is the highest one overall, it was quite high in several species of birds. I'm going to talk about that first. 
There was another study that found that as little as two milligrams of zinc can kill some birds if they eat it consistently like two milligrams a day for about two weeks, Mm -hmm. which is not very much. Two milligrams is a very small amount. Like a milligram is a thousandth of a gram, and a gram is already (laughs) not a lot of material. But it's unclear exactly how much zinc the birds are eating. The worst concentration in the bird feathers was 0.4 milligrams per gram in the little stint, (laughs) which is a small wading bird. If two milligrams a day is toxic, maybe not to this bird, you know, it could be a a higher amount. That was kind of the minimum that became deadly to a species of bird. But we're getting to that sort of level. It's certainly a high enough level to be concerned about all that zinc that's getting into these birds' bodies because you're starting to approach lethal levels potentially. There are also other metals that are very risky. So nickel, which was the next highest found in the concentration of the birds, doesn't have a known toxic level, but too much nickel can cause excess pigmentation, like that frog that Maria mentioned, (laughs) where Mm -hmm. it just sort of goes nuts. I wonder if it's the same effect where basically their body is trying to get rid of that nickel, so they're producing a ton of extra pigmentation. Maybe that's what's happening. And it can also lead to excess molting as well, which obviously is a problem if you're trying to fly, if you're molting too much. The effects of excess Cobalt, chromium, and copper haven't been well studied in birds, but they think that some of them might be linked to issues with fertility of the birds or other, you know, basic functions that they need to live. We do know quite a bit, though, about lead. So even though the lead levels were pretty low relative to the other metals, lead is very toxic. And the lead levels in several birds are at a point where it could potentially start weakening their ability to regulate body temperature, the ability to walk, the ability to recognize siblings, and the ability to remember things like when and where to migrate. Obviously, very big problems. Yes. The the fact that they started with the ability to regulate body temperature, like, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much a death sentence. For mercury, the levels were also dangerously high, and at too high of a concentration, that can also lead to death and other really nasty side effects. But maybe more importantly, for humans at least, is that mercury and lead are also very toxic to us. So the levels that are accumulating in the birds should serve as a warning because if they're getting it, you know, even if we don't eat those birds, we're still surrounded by the same environment. And if there's a lot of this getting into the environment, getting into the shellfish, getting into the plants, all that kind of stuff, even getting into the water table, it could be very bad for people. So we should heed the warnings of these bird feathers. Yeah. (laughs) And maybe in the future, I don't know, there's all sorts of interesting ways to monitor environmental contamination. I wonder if we could start using things like bird feathers as a, a tool to test how much of these contaminants are getting into the environment. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you again for listening. If you are not yet part of our community of fellow dinosaur enthusiasts, then check out our page, patreon.com slash Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.